the Lightning Hour, Halloween season edition, an hour-long energy drink for your mind, three hosts, three actors, three friends, three perspectives, and incredible guests every Friday at noon. I'm your host, Rico E. Anderson. I'm your host, Sasha Kerville. And I'm your host, Rochelle Henry. Prepare yourselves for 60 minutes of high-voltage ghoulish conversation. And get ready to supercharge your spooky spooky brain. Because it's time for the Lightning Hour! <laughs> Let's get ready to meet she was born and raised in Detroit, Michigan, and loved storytelling so much that even as a child, she knew she was destined to act. She performed in plays at the University of Michigan and later was accepted into Columbia University's Master of Fine Arts program in acting, from which she graduated. While in New York, she also studied with Uta Hagen, Stella Adler, and Lee Strasberg. She also made her film debut in New York in Hester Street. Shortly thereafter that, she took a gamble and flew to Los Angeles after hearing that Jack Nicholson was interested in meeting her for the role that she was cast in the film Going South. Upon her move to Los Angeles, her love of theater inspired her and a small group of actors to put together a theater company called the Los Angeles Theater Unit, which lasted for a decade and earned many awards. Her most memorable performance was in the original play, Better Days, which earned her a Drama Log Award for Best Actress. She has undoubtedly become one of the industry's greatest chameleons. The Farrelly brothers cast her in a series of memorable characters, beginning with their hit comedy, Dumb and Dumber, and then as the infamous landlady in Kingpin, opposite Woody Harrelson, and again as the character Magda, the sun-withered neighbor of Cameron Diaz in their hit film, There is Something About Mary. The horror genre also found her, starting with a cult classic, Critters, and then onto Wes Craven's A Nightmare on Elm Street, which paved the way for more in the genre. She worked on a trio of movies with director Tim Sullivan, 2001 Maniacs, starring opposite Robert Englund, its sequel, 2001 Maniacs, Field of Screams, and Sullivan's Chillerama. She also starred in the cult classic Snakes on a Plane opposite Samuel L. Jackson and the independent films The Signal starring Lawrence Fishburne, Jack Goes Home, Abattoir, Buster's Malhart, and The Midnight Man reuniting with Robert Englund. She also stars in the February release of the indie Cleopatra Sony film Get Gone starring our very own Rico E. Anderson. 2010, she found herself in the blockbuster hit Insidious, directed by James Wan, which led to Insidious Chapter 2, Insidious Chapter 3, and the blockbuster hit Insidious The Last Key, in which she has become, according to James Wan, the name of the franchise. She most recently received rave reviews for her role of Joyce in Tommy Stovall's Room for Rent, which she also served as co-producer. She also starred in this year's Sony's The Grudge, and the feature Dreamcatcher, which she served as executive producer. Later this year, she produced and starred opposite horror icon Tobin Bell in The Call, directed by Timothy Woodward. She also appears in Max Reload and the Nether Blasters, released this year. She has a solid resume in the television, as well as guest appearances, which include American Gothic and Still the King. She most recently appeared in a recurring role as Dottie in Showtime's Penny Dreadful, City of Angels series. She just received a 2020 Daytime Emmy for Outstanding Guest Performer in a Digital Drama Series for Eastsiders on Netflix. For all her achievements in the horror genre, she was named the Godmother of Horror by Wizard World Comic Con. She is also a lifetime member of the Actor Studio. Let's get ready to meet our electrifying guest. These hauntings can be terrifying things. Maybe the fear of the beyond overcame the fear of getting caught. Hmm. Or maybe he wanted to get caught. <laughs> what? What is it? I'm sorry. I'm uh, seeing things. The shock of the whole thing, I suppose. Do you need me for anything else? No. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our guest, Lynn Shay. Hey! Hey! Lynn, so happy to see you. Thank you so much. 
so much for coming to the show. And uh, first of all, Lynn, congratulations on your recent daytime Emmy for outstanding guest performance in a digital drama series for Eastsiders on Netflix. Whoa, that was the best plug ever. Thank you so much. <laughs> I That was so unexpected and really, I mean, I'm, I, I barely can believe it in a way because I, I just because I think in general when I work or probably when all of us work, you know, you don't really expect anything other than hope you, you, you did well on the show and sort of that that's the end of it. And sort of this came at such a uh, crazy time in general. It was really beyond welcome. So, and I think I really really get us they send me a real thing <laughs> I thought it was just a certificate pretty much because um I mean I do I always think of you know Emmys for the big shows on television but I guess this is does not diminish the celebration and the honor so I'm very grateful you well deserved, of course. congratulations Lynn let's go back to the beginning as a child we know you loved storytelling what type of impact did storytelling have on you that you knew at such a young age that you wanted to be an actress I never really thought about being an actress, to be honest. I liked making up stories, and my parents were really pretty great. I grew up a long time before you guys, and it was a definitely simpler time. I mean, maybe internally it wasn't for people, but I think it was because the exterior of the world we lived in was much different and much simpler. And so my dad used to tell me what we called Candyland stories. So he was the one that would tuck me in at, at night and he would make up stories every night before I went to sleep about a little girl named Linda. And um, sorry, <laughs> um, there'd be a little tap, tap, tap on her window. And he would do that on my, on my window. And I, and I would always go like, oh, you know, it was like suddenly it was real. And um, that the window would open and a little fairy would fly in and there was a little silver horse with wings that she would bring and put Linda on. And we would fly back out the window and I had a backyard and we would go up over the big oak tree and over the, the Goldman's house who was across the way. You know, he had a whole thing about, then we'd go past the Allen's house and he would take me all through the real neighborhood on my little horse. And you know, when you're four and five and six years old, I mean, that's all real. And the journey was to Candyland, which was a land of um, trees filled with delicatessen sandwiches. <laughs> I mean, really, we had salami sandwiches and we had dill pickles. <laughs> and we had rivers of red pop. My, uh, we're Jewish. <laughs> My father loved, loved deli food. <laughs> My candy land was from the Jewish candy land, and it was delicious. <laughs> and then we'd have cheesecake for dessert. I love it. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> this is a therapy session as well as an interview, by the way. <laughs> anyway, so th that was sort of the beginning of stories, you know, and and I, I don't think I ever added anything to his stories because they were sort of perfect. And also, yeah. I, there were no kids in my neighborhood. We had one one guy across the street, one boy across the street, and he was sort of my best friend. And we would make up stories about giants and, and cowboy, you know, real sort of boy stories, basically, what you would call boy stories. There was nothing with little dolls and that kind of stuff. <laughs> and so Ly Lionel, his name was Lionel. And so we used to play, but I spent most of my time by myself, <laughs> playing by myself. And I had my own room, which was really beautiful. It was a little pink and white room that my mom helped let me help decorate. And I would make up these stories with my dolls and my stuffed animals. And I would take all my clothes out of the closet. And I had two, I remember I had French doors to my closet that opened, you know, sort of both open. And there were a, a mirror on each side. And I would dress up in, in different outfits. And I would make up stories with my animals and my dolls that were full on. I would do all the voices and all the characters. And if I had to clean up, I would pick up where I left off the next day. I mean, it was sort of like serials. They were episodic. It was already episodic television. And uh, then there was a little girl that moved in next door to me uh, named Andrea, Andy, who I I just found, by the way, after 50 years, she lives in, in Haifa. She lives in Israel. Anyway, that's another story. But Andy, she was my girlfriend. We were the same age. If I wasn't sleeping at her house, she was sleeping at my house. I mean, we were t inseparable. 
and she had the same kind of really kind of imagination as I did. And we didn't have no television. There was no television, no phones. I mean, and it was all from here. It was all from your own imagination. And we would make up these incredible games and stories. And we had a neighborhood newspaper and we built doll houses and, and neighborhoods in our around our dolls houses and all the stuff we found around the house my mom and my mom was great she would give us she'd give us like torn up dish towels and scissors and thread and ribbon you know she'd give us all this material and we would build stuff and we would it's all a way of using our own imagination i really think kids are are suffering today from lack of imagination because it's all done for you it's all on this thing and we had nothing like that so it was sort of we would make up plays you know we would do plays and I remember <laughs> we also had this one game with thread where we would do like a it was this treasure hunt so we would have one of us would close our eyes or not go and you know be quiet for a little bit and the other one would go we would go out and I would take thread and we'd wind it around the house my whole house <laughs> <laughs> and my mother would step over it. <laughs> she was like, you know, she knew we were playing. And so she just, did, you know, we did anywhere we wanted it. And then at each destination, we would write a little note that had a, um, a rhyme to it. Like, if you want to know what's here, look under the, the stuffed deer. You know, there we, we would, and then you'd go to the stuffed deer that was a, like a little stuffed animal. And there'd be another note there. And so it was a treasure hunt that would take us all over the house. And at the end, you would get a prize. And the prize was usually crepe paper flowers that we would make. Or we'd make animals out of pipe cleaners and, and make like a little family. We really were, were talented kids. That was how I gave birth to being an actress. It was constantly using my fantasy, my imagination, and, and not answering to anybody else's spectrums. You know, it was like, it was all my own. It was all ours. It was invaluable. And that's still how I work. I still work from that place way back that I still access. I mean, nothing takes me away from that because it's, it's really my own core. And that sort of then started feeding into plays at school. You know, when I started kindergarten, I remember I was always I was always the one that wanted to act out or tell a story. And I was very shy. But that was where I, I wasn't shy. That was where I, I hid kind of myself. My fullest self came forward, but it was where I felt safe. I would, you know, always get the part. Not the big parts. I always got the little parts. All through grade school and high school. And then when I went to college, I went to University of Michigan. And I was an art history major. I didn't even major in theater or acting or anything. I, I, but I was always in auditioning for stuff at, at, at Michigan. You know, like they had a, a theater lab. And I, but I wasn't part of the the big theater community. There was a, a wonder, the APA actually, which was the, uh, I forget what that stands for, which was a wonderful theater company with Rosemary Harris and Alice Rabb. These are probably people you don't know who they were, but um, were very well accomplished Broadway actors. And they had a theater company at U of M. And, um, but I never, I never was part of that. And I graduated Michigan and got a job. I, I was at, at the uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art in the registrar's office. I, I moved to New York. There's a lot of stuff in between. I went to Europe for my year abroad all by myself, which was a whole nother story, a whole nother chapter. <laughs> um, but when I came back, I got this job. And I just remember I was in the basement of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And I was going, I wonder, well, why, there's nothing to audition for, you know, because I wasn't in school anymore. So, and I thought to myself, well, maybe I should, you know, why don't I go back to school? So I quit that and I, I applied to graduate school and I ended up going to Columbia in their theater arts department. They had a brand new theater arts program. I got accepted. And then I realized there was a name for the profession I wanted to do, which was acting. I mean, it really didn't occur to me before that. And from there, I stayed in New York and did theater for many years before I came out to LA even. But so I never thought about, I'm going to be an actress. I followed what I did best. And I feel, I still think I, I mean, I'm not tooting my horn because I don't have one, but, <laughs> but I, I'm really good at being able to step into someone else. It's, it, it's a talent. I don't know how or why I know how to do it, or I don't know why I'm good at it, but I know it's something I'm good. I can do. And I love doing it. And I'm free in that space. That's where I become the same way like being a little kid. I feel like that's my, that's my safe space because that's where I can tell the deepest truth about me through someone else. In real life, you can't always do that. 
So it's a very luxurious profession to be able to really tap into your own personal truth, I think. When, when I hear that story, especially the stories of you being a little girl and pulling those thoughts and stories out of your young brain, you know, it's yeah. just like, I mean, th those are the things that fuel our creativity as a whole. And as a sci-fi nerd myself, Black Panther, I feel like for some of us, it never goes away as adults. And that's, again, my parents who were classic 1950s parents, very conservative, very Republican, very, you know, uh, by the book. My mother was a real lady. She, she, you know, she was originally, she was born in Russia and came to the United States when she was 13 years old and learned perfect English. She, she, she wanted to become an American woman, and she did. And they would have been classic people to, to try to push me into some place. And great, gratefully, because of my mother's um, original abandon, I mean, she was a, you know, a little Russian girl. This, I mean, she was born in 1913. So she and her mom and her, they kind of escaped because her father had died in a whole long story with that and her family. But they had families somewhere in the U.S. who, you know, they got on the boat, literally, <laughs> and came to this country. And my mom was always this very uh, unstoppable energy is the only way I can really describe her. She became that woman that she wanted to become, but she never, and she wanted me to do it too, in many respects, you know, she wanted me to be a, a lady and I was never a lady. <laughs> I'm still not a lady. I mean, she's just like, but that didn't mean she wasn't balls. She had this other fire in her, a very emancipated woman within the world she lived in, which was not emancipated at that time at all, really. It was very, um, you know, very much by the book. But she, she was, I adored my mom. I adored both my parents. I had great parents. Although my brother's opinion is different than mine. <laughs> what, what part of Russia? What? <laughs> what part of Russia was your mom from? Because I am from Russia. She was born in Odessa and they lived in Kiev. So she, and I know stories about her, her, you know, when she was a little girl, she was one of five children and apparently they were upper class czar, you know, czarist Jews. And that when the Bolsheviks came in, they took over their house. And it, I often wonder really what happened because I never really, my mom never talked too much about it, but it, it, it sounds like they were moved in. Her, her brothers had both died and um, one of the flu and one of a sunstroke, I think it was, her sister was already married and out of the house. And the Bolsheviks took over this large, they, apparently my mom, they had a pretty big house and they moved them, my, my mom and her mother into one room. And, uh, you know, we never discussed what office, the Bolshevik officers felt about a young 13 year old girl and her mother. You know, I mean, those are, questions I never asked and I never really thought to ask, but I'm sure there was bad stuff that happened. I'd just be willing to bet on it. But, um, but she never discussed any of that ever with me and was really a very wonderful woman. And again, I, I sort of feel like I absorbed my mother's heat of who she, who she was because she was very on the outside, you know, but that wasn't her. <laughs> I knew the truth. I read that you also studied with the iconic Uta Hagen, Stella Adler, and Lee Strasberg. Yeah, I did. So what was it like studying with such legends, and what are some of the biggest takeaways that you learned from them? Those are great questions, and again, I really lucked out. When I was in New York, when I, after I finished Columbia, off of Broadway, the whole that whole scene of the of showcases, you know, which you could do for equity showcases, which the union sanctioned, uh, was just getting underway. So there were there was huge opportunities to do theater, and all the theater companies, which are now huge, like the Manhattan Theater Club, the American Place Theater, the Chelsea Theater Center, Lincoln Center, these were all just getting going at that time, and so we never went for very long without doing play readings, being in a play. I was very much a part of Playwrights Horizons. Um, Bob Moss, who started Playwrights Horizons, was a, a good friend and I did lots of theater. I did two for The Seesaw with, uh, that he put me in with a, another, I, I can't remember the actor's name, James, was it James Cunningham? This was years and years ago. But I got to play the iconic role in, in two, for, two for The Seesaw and I decided I wanted to take classes. So uh, Uta Hagen was teaching at the Berghoff studio. 
And I wasn't so interested in Herbert Berghoff, but I really, I mean, I was always a huge, you know, she's definitely a legend. And um, you had to audition for her class. So um, there's an actor named Stuart Pankin, who's still acting. I, I haven't seen him in years, but we did a scene from another part of the forest, which is a, a play by Lillian Hellman. And when I was at Columbia, we had the good fortune, we, since we were in New York, it was a three-year program, and Joe Papp, who started the public theater, was one of our directing teachers, and we did some wonderful plays, and we did another part of the forest as one of our productions, and uh, the character's name is Bertie Bagtree, I remember, and so Stuart's, we decided to do that first scene, and I auditioned for her, and not everybody got in. I mean, it was, pre it was pretty hard to get in. I was really thrilled I was accepted into her class. Probably the most important part of it was that she really, she really loved me, and she didn't like very many actresses. She was very hard on that, and Stella Adler was like that too. They were both very um, critical of actresses in particular, and Udo was a fantastic teacher. I mean, just fantastic. And we would do scene work and um, private moments and all that. I also, I think I, for that even, or it was kind of in conjunction, I decided to audition. I was uh, um, an observer at the actor studio. I got an observership. And Sally Kirkland, who is still a wonderful actress and still working, she was kind of a mentor for me there, I think, because I, I, I learned yoga and she wanted me to teach her yoga class. So I got a sort of an observership because I taught yoga to Rue McClanahan. We had this sort of very auspicious group of, of actors that were there at the time, Ellen Burstyn, um, Shelley Winters was one of the moderators. I mean, these, it was really a really exciting time. And in, in exchange for doing Sally's, you heard this favor, which for me was really the favor, I was allowed to observe. And then, and then Lee was still very much a part of it at the time. And I auditioned for him five times. <laughs> and finally, and, and he used to, he made you do that. I mean, that was like part of his plan. You know, you had to be able to live through it. Right. And you had to not be discouraged because you didn't get in. You know, it's not like, oh, I didn't get in. And then you, you just keep going until you get in. And he also was very supportive of me. He told me I had, and Mark Rydell was one of our moderators, who was also just fantastic. So part of, for me, what was important about it was the, the affirmation of my talent and of what I had to offer. I remember when I got into the actor's studio, it was, a, it was really, it was, it was a big deal because it was my fifth audition. And at that time, sort of in conjunction, I was working with Uda. And Uda has still, there's a great book called Respect for Actors. Yes. That's one of the yeah, best we'll have it. <laughs> textbooks. I mean, it really tells you this works. If you do this, you figure this out and this out and this out, it's going to work. I mean, there's, it's not magic. You just have to do the work. So they really, they changed the way I felt about myself as much as teaching me things to do. And that's very important because you really do have to, you have to have courage to go to those places that may not work and that you don't think will work, but you have to be able to, you know, there's, there is a roadmap to, there's partly a roadmap and there's partly no roadmap is the way kind of I work. There's sort of, there's elements. I'm always, when I read a script, I'm always, the very first time I read it, I have to have a pencil because I'll never remember those, those first thoughts whether it's a piece of wardrobe or an idea or something and, and my margins and I'm, I'm right all over the place and stuff. So there's that part of it. And then there's, you know, then there's the translation, even after you've done all that work and you have figured it out, you have to throw it all away. Cause once you're on set or once you're in the scene with another actor or you're on, you're on set and you didn't know there was going to be a bed and a glass of water over there and a picture of your family over here, you, you don't know what your touch points are until you're actually in a physical surrounding. So it's a really, it's a very, it's a big juggling act. You have to be able to totally give up what you think and what you know, and you have to totally hang on to what you think and what you know at the same time. I think I learned so, you know, some of that from both from Lee and from Uta Hagen. Um, Stella Adler was not till I came out to California. And she, <laughs> I remember um, we were at the Santa Monica Playhouse, that little the little theater on Santa Monica Boulevard. And um, I remember walking into her first class and we were in the auditorium, sort of, it's a small, fairly small, but maybe see 40 people, 30 people, something like that. And the class came in and we all sat down and we were all kind of waiting for Stella. I remember looking and there was a, a person in the corner, like 
sort of in the dark. And I remember seeing, thought it was like a little, I thought it was a little girl. Like I thought it was, um, you know, a young girl sitting in the corner. Then uh, the, the assistant came in and said, you know, uh, Miss Adler is, you know, ready to start the class. And that little girl suddenly stood up and I watched this woman fill with air. It was almost like, I mean, she suddenly expanded. And this it was crazy because she was just sort of sitting quietly. And suddenly she became Stella Adler. And she came in with this grandiose, bigger than life persona and this big voice, this very supported vocal. And here's Stella with this booming voice welcoming us all. <laughs> and um, it was really exciting. And so we did scene study, you know, she would give us partners. And again, because of her stature and because of her reputation, and this was also from Uda, same thing from Uda and from Lee, these people are legendary in our profession. They are, they are the profession. So when she, when she would support you and she was, she was brutal. She threw people out of class. She'd say, get out. She would throw you out. And that was it. You, go, you don't come back. Oh. They didn't do the word, get out. So the fact that if you get support and, and reassurance from them, it's great. I mean, then you really start to feel stronger about yourself. You know, for unfortunately, that's the, that's the way the world works. And in general, I think we all need to have a reassurance from people who know more than us and who we admit know more than us. We're so busy thinking we know everything because we don't know anything. So for me, it was a, a real vote of confidence that I was in the right in the right place, and that I had that I was on the right track in terms of my own creativity and ideas and means of expression. It's like to be able to really believe believe where you are. There's 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 that sort of thing that happens because you're just pretending. I mean, we're all you know we're just pretending. I'm pretending that I'm whatever, you know, but you're not pretending. So again, it's that sort of thing. You're, you're in and you're out at the same time. And it's, it's a little bit schizophrenic, but uh, very rewarding when it works because there's that other place then that happens, I find anyway. And I've had it only happen maybe a dozen times in my whole career where there's something else, like, especially if it's in like a monologue or a moment on, it could be in a play or a film, it doesn't matter, but where something else takes hold, it's sort of like all the imaginary aspects become so real that they tap into something that you didn't even know you had, and it's exquisite. It's exquisite. That's the only way I can describe it. It's really emotional and really exquisite. I struck, you can't, and it's like, you can't have it. You can't take it because once you do it, you've lost it. Well, your love of the theater is very prominent. And I love that being so passionately of it. And, you know, being a child of the theater, I always felt that, that everybody should start off uh, doing theater. Uh, just, you know, if, if this is the career that you want to be, because you just learn so much that you wouldn't learn jumping straight into film. And you did uh, theater in New York, but you also did theater here in Los Angeles as well. Yeah, we did. Sure? Yeah, and you had a theater company called the Los Angeles Theater Unit. You guys did your homework. <laughs> we read a couple of things on you. Really? Oh, my God. I, I moved to L.A. in 1977 from New York. I'd been in New York since 67, since 66, really. That's a whole story. I'm sure you probably read it. I mean, where I, I came out to meet Jack Nicholson for a, a line in Going South, which was just on television the other night. And I forgot how naive that movie is and how silly it is. And it was Mary Steenburgen very first movie and Jack was one of these um, people he kind of I have never really seen him since then but he I mean this is a story do you want to hear the story is, or if you don't know the story oh we want to hear that <laughs> okay the story goes kind of I had just been fired from a play in New York <laughs> I was a wreck I was so upset. And actually, it was a play that was supposed to go uh, in Boston. It was a regional, a regional theater of Candide, starring Eva Marie Saint, who I don't know if you know who she is, but one of our great actor studio actresses. She was in On the Waterfront with Marlon Brando. She's a, one of the most exquisite young actresses you'll ever meet or ever see. And it was she was going to play Candida, or Candide, however you pronounce it. And um, I was supposed to play the role of Prosy, which is a, a terrific role. And I got fired before we even went. And I was a mess. And the reason I got fired, they actually sent me a letter, which I never opened until I was so mad and so sad. I just put it and didn't, didn't read it until months later when I found out the reason I got fired is because I looked like I was 12 years old on stage. I mean, I was in my 30s. I, looked, I did. I looked like I was 12. And she was in her 50s 
trying to play a woman in her 30s and they felt I made her look too old because <laughs> and uh, I looked like I was 12 I mean I, even I saw some photos of us and I thought I look like I'm 12 years old <laughs> so um, anyway so that was why I got fired although that didn't help me at that moment so my agent calls I actually had an agent which was rare also and he said um, we just got uh, Jack Nicholson, uh, Marion Doherty, who is, who is a very famous casting director. Oh, yes. I've seen a documentary about her. She's Yeah, she, she did everybody. She, De Niro, all these people were her people, basically. Jack was doing a movie, and they were in, they had come to New York, and um, they, they, they wanted, Jack wanted to know more information about me. That, and I thought, what are you talking about? They said, well, they went back to California yesterday, but so we want to send them your picture and resume. And I said, well, okay. And um, they said it's for, you know, for this movie called Going South. And Mary Steenburgen has just been cast. It's her very first film. So I said, well, you'll do something. <laughs> it was Jack Nicholson. Do something. So they said, well, we're sending your picture and resume. So I went scurrying around my, uh, my little apartment that was this big pulled out every picture I could find of myself. So I would be naivete. This is and writing a note. Dear Mr. Nicholson, <laughs> you know, thank, I am a big note writer. And by the way, write notes because it works. I mean, it works meaning you, you make contact with people. So um, dear Mr. Nicholson, I said, thank you so much for your interest in me. <laughs> and I don't even know where he saw, it might've been the Academy players he saw a picture. I don't even know to this day. Right so I said, this is me with curly hair. This is me with straight hair. This is me with a bow. <laughs> This is me with my hair behind my ears. <laughs> this is me happy. This is me sad. <laughs> and I literally put together a little packet, and I was dead serious. I wasn't trying to be cute or anything. It was just, if you saw a picture, show them more pictures that, you know, maybe there's a role for me in this. So um, I put it all together in an envelope, and I'm going to send it special delivery. There was no FedEx even then. I mean, it was like special delivery, air mail. It, it will go the, for the next day. And I put P.S., um, I plan to be in Los Angeles for a short visit in the next couple of weeks, which was total bullshit. I mean, I, it, <laughs> and I put it in thing and I take it to the post office and send it out. And the next day or whatever it was that, that they received it, my agent calls back and he says, do you know him? That was, I remember the first, I said, what? what? He said, do you know him? I said, no, who? He said, do you know Nicholson? I said, no. He said, because we got a note back that Jack wants to meet you as soon as you're in Los Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> so I packed dirty laundry and I got on a plane the next morning to LA. I only person I knew here was um, Betty Buckley had come to do Eight is Enough, which was this awful series on television. And Betty had been a good friend of mine in New York. She taught a, a singing class for actors that I was in. She was staying at the Chateau Marmont, which I didn't know anything. I had never been to Los Angeles. I had no idea what anything was. I didn't know what the Chateau Marmont was. She said, I'll get you a, a room, you know, come, come and I'll, um, and I met some somebody on the plane that gave me a ride to the Chateau. I mean, I didn't know what I was doing. And my appointment was for the next morning. However, <laughs> due to the stress of the, the situation, I got a fever blister on my mouth that to this day, it was, I, I, I look, I really, I look like this and I'm not joking. And I could feel it getting bigger and bigger on the plane. Mm -hmm. And I'm sort of trying to, I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to pretend this is not happening. My, my appointment at Paramount, I called the cab company 46 times. The cab company was going to pick me up at quarter to nine because I had a, a, a 10 o'clock appointment. <laughs> I wanted to make sure I got there in plenty of time. <laughs> so, um, so I got up in the morning and it was horrible. I mean, really, now it's oozing. And I know if, if any of you have ever had fever blisters, they are the worst and they're painful. And so I put, I remember putting on, I had so much mascara on because I kept thinking if I could just really make my eyes really pop, <laughs> maybe, you know, he won't, you know, it'll be fine. I'm going to be fine. I'm going to be fine. It's all fine. So I get there. I remember walking through those gates at Paramount, which was really just like in the movies, you know, really that moment of walking through God's gates, <laughs> you know, you're, you're on your way to heaven. <laughs> So I walk in and I sit down and I'm sort of all being quiet by myself. And I remember they were talking about Mary Steenburgen's skin. There was something about they wanted to make sure her skin was good. And there were all these phone calls back and forth to skin doctors <laughs> while I'm sitting there. And I'm sure Mary would love it that I knew that. And, um, <laughs> 
and I'm just sitting minding my own business. Okay, so now we walk in. It's my turn. So I get up and I go in. I go walk into Jack's office, which had all of our pictures up on his wall. My picture was up there, my resume shot. Okay. And um, he's sitting at his desk and he's got his head down and he doesn't even, he just kind of has his head down. And he says, um, well, let's see here. He's looking at my resume. If there's anything here we can talk about. And then he looks up at me with that classic, like Jack Nicholson look. And he said, what happened to your mouth? <laughs> <laughs> And I go, my mouth. <laughs> what are you talking about, Jack? <laughs> what mouth? I said, oh, I know. I said, I know, I know. I said, I didn't really just come out here to meet you. I, <laughs> I was really going to come here anyway. I really, really was going to come here anyway. And I started babbling, and he was, he was so sweet. He just said, he just <laughs> listened and he just kind of just sat there listening to me babble away about how I really didn't come out here just to meet him with a fever blister, this giant. And he said, uh, well, you know, I've lived with an actress long enough to know how, how upsetting that would be. But he said, um, but don't worry about it. <laughs> and then he, um, he said, um, these are for some small roles. He said, I have, there's four women I'm casting. There's, they're four spinsters because at the beginning of the movie, they're all like trying to get Nicholson off the gallows. I mean, it's a kind of a silly, kind of a cute beginning. And he says, so these are for four women who are all trying to, you know, sort of um, vying for him. And he said, but he said, I could also make it three spinsters and a parasol lady. And I said, uh, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> and that's all he said. He said, I'll know in a few days. So I said, okay, okay. Thank you very much. And I walked out of there and I didn't know where I was. I mean, I literally was, was out of, shot out of a cannon. I mean, I didn't know where I was, what I was doing, why I was doing it. And <laughs> I went back to the Chateau and long story short, I figured I would stay at least until I uh, heard if I got the job or not. And they were going to Durango. He said, we're leaving for Durango in the morning. So they were already, you know, the, the, the film was already up pretty much it was all cast really it was Danny DeVito and Christopher Lloyd and um, John Belushi and Jack and Mary Steenburgen so in the meantime I can't remember exactly the time frame but I guess my mouth started getting better and I ended up getting a job um, on a movie of the week with F. Marie Abraham and Judith Light I mean it was crazy it was it was, and it was a really cute guest star called Sex and the Married Woman it's still on online you can find it and uh, I played F. Murray Abraham's wife, and I got the job based on this tape that I, I, I didn't even remember having it sent out. I guess my agent, you know, sent the tape out to, um, to this cast. It was Jeff, Jeffrey Fisher. I remember Universal. He died very young. Um, he was the casting director. And I shot this episode of this movie, and I, I'd have to look to see if I still have a fever blister. I can't remember what the time frame was. But this was before I had heard anything about going south yet. And I just it suddenly just appeared, you know, I got this job. So we did the, I did the job. I got a review in Variety. I mean, it was it, 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 this still, so I guess it was a couple weeks later. And then I get a call saying that Jack uh, wants you in Mexico. You have one line in the movie. And I was the parasol lady. <laughs> so I went to Durango and and was there for two weeks, you know, because it was all these little crowd scenes. And that was my entrance to, to Los Angeles. I mean, it was really pretty crazy. And then I kept, and then I stayed and I found an apartment finally. And, and I gave up stuff in New York. I, I realized I really wanted to be out here. Felt like everything was going my way. And then of course, everything comes to a dead halt. You know, that's the way that works too. <laughs> then I don't have an agent and then blah, 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 you know, and all that stuff. But it was with total focus on what I wanted to have happen. I mean, I didn't, this was no magic thing. It was just, and I was, it was so naive. I mean, that I wrote this note to him and if I hadn't done that, none of that would have happened at all. I mean, it wouldn't have, he wasn't gonna, he, he was somehow endeared by this whole, this sort of silly little girl who was. But you're always, humble and it keeps you grounded and it is the thing that you don't come off as conceited. You know that you still got work to do. And that's that's a beautiful thing about what we do. No matter what our level of success is, we're still pushing, we're still grinding, we're still getting ourselves out there. We're still writing that letter to that big old star who you're like, they ain't going 
dance to me. You know what yeah. I mean? And you know, it doesn't always work. I mean, it doesn't always work that way. I mean, I mean, I guess it comes down to what is your motive to wanting to be or do what you're doing. I don't have a motive to be. I'm gonna, you know, when you listen to these young, some of these young actors, you know, I'm gonna be a star, and I'm. I don't. I still don't even know what that means. I just pray that I get hired to do something that's fun and that I do a good job at. I'm a very good writer. I think lots about character, um, how a character would express something. The, the one experience I just had, which was very humbling and very scary, Penny Dreadful, the, the latest Penny Dreadful that just finished, there's, there was another season and, and Showtime canceled it because of the pandemic and just money. It was too, it's, it, there's no way they could have done it. It's an exquisite series. It's on Showtime, 10 episodes. It's worth seeing. It's really, it's like watching opera. And John Logan, who is the showrunner, has done Broadway. He's a Broadway musical guy. He's a phenomenal writer, a phenomenal writer, and has, you know, worked for Scorsese. And I mean, he's, I mean, he's got more awards in his house. I, we went there for this little party. It was just like, this. <laughs> it was like an entire room filled with things. He made it very clear when we started the series, this is a writer's show. When I write gonna, I don't mean going to. And when I write going to, I don't mean gonna. And you had to be letter punctuation perfect. No changes. No. And and because his television and, and his dialogue is very, I mean, God, Nathan Lane, who is has this exquisite role in it, he had page, like there'd be five pages of him talking. And Nathan Lane was, he never missed, never missed a word. Never, ever, ever missed a word. I was so scared. I actually froze on one line. I couldn't, <laughs> I became, this was just, this was just a few months ago because I had nothing to hang it on. And I was so nervous. John Logan is such a genius. It's, How dare you even, even deign to think you're going to change a word and make it better because that's just, he's an exquisite writer. I mean, it is like, like, it's like Shakespeare. It's like American Shakespeare. And the syntax is very, I mean, seriously, if you, if you have just watched one episode of it, and you'll kind of see what I'm talking about. It's not the way you talk. It's the way you express something through dialogue. But it's, it's not really the way I would talk. There's nothing naturalistic about it. Today, our guest is Emmy Award winning. Jay <laughs> of the Insidious series and Penny Dreadful, and A Nightmare on Elm Street, and There's Something About Mary. But this is the Lightning Hour with Rico Russell and Sasha, <laughs> and we will be right back. Banana, banana, we're gonna be buying bananas tonight. Whoa. Why is that? Because back when I was your age, I always used to make myself a big banana split after sex. I think you're gonna need one tonight. Oh. Don't get ahead of yourself, Magda. You'll probably be eating a banana split before I do. Don't bet on it. Last time I had a pap smear, the guy needed leather gloves and an oyster shocker. <laughs> you developed a long-standing relationship with the Fairley brothers, who cast you in a variety of roles in such cult films as Dumb and Dumber with Jim Carrey, Kingpin with Woody Harrelson, and there is something about Mary as Magda, uh, the sun withered neighbor of Cameron Diaz. What was that about working with the Fairley brothers that continuously made you want to come back for more? And which of the three films was the most fun experience? Well, I met them kind of unbeknownst. My brother, Bob Shea, started New Line Cinema in 1968 in his apartment in New wow. York. So, so Bobby is Bobby's my big brother. Uh, <laughs> whoa! Yes. And the Fairley brothers, and I mean, that's a whole nother long story, um, but Bob, when uh, New Line started out doing pretty much um, uh, lecture series. It didn't even do films in the beginning. It was uh, lectures to college campuses. Then slowly Bob got the idea to, to, to acquire some art films for the art cinemas in all these different college towns. You know, every college town has an art cinema, basically. By the time Pete Fairley had this movie, Dumb and Dumber, which I guess they had shopped around, and Pete had never made a movie, they had never made a movie before, and they took it to Bob, and I didn't know about any of this. And then I get a phone call from Rick Montgomery, who was their casting director. And he said, there's a, a, a role of a character that's gonna be shooting, I, I forget where we shot, I think it was in Rhode Island. He said, uh, it's, you know, it's a scene and he's offering me the role. And I'm like, oh my God, oh, yes, oh yes, of course. 
and I was trying to figure out, I knew it was New Line. They told me it was New Line. So I thought, so I, I called my brother thinking it was for Buff and, um, and Jeff Daniels and, and, you know, Jim Carrey were signed on and I didn't know too much about, you know, I knew who they were obviously, but I didn't think too much of it. I knew the scene was with Jeff. So I was kind of excited about that. We did the scene and I had all my little acting ideas that this woman's a dog owner and you know how people look like their dogs. So I wanted the makeup hair to do my hair like a poodle, a French poodle in the front. We did all these little curls like a poodle's haircut. <laughs> and I wanted to wear this little coat that was kind of a hound tooth coat. I'm just something that was sort of doggy head doggy. And the tag of the film uh, of the scene was after I, I opened the van to, and I see the dogs um, you know, all covered in mustard and ketchup before the dog show. It just says she screams. So I said to Pete, well, what if instead of screaming, she whimpers like a dog? So I was like, oh! <laughs> and he loved it. He said, oh, yeah, that's a great idea. And in the beginning, they didn't know who I was. I didn't know who they were. And then they, and then I remember at that, sort of, everybody sort of started looking at me a little different. You know, and Jeff, even Jeff said, oh, that's a great idea. So we shot the scene and Pete loved it. The producer was there, this guy named Charlie Wessler was one of the producers. And, and that was it, it was one day. So I, I went home. And so from Dumb and Dumber, Kingpin was next. I just remember seeing the listing in Variety and it just said that, um, that, they, that these guys were doing this movie and there was this character. I called their office and their assistant sent me the script. And there's a character who's described as the angriest, ugliest woman God ever let loose on the planet. That is ours. <laughs> and I thought, I got to play that part. Whatever that is, I have to play that role. And I created that character that's on camera I called and I tried and I wrote notes and everybody kept saying, we love your work, but you're just not right for this role and blah, blah, blah. And meanwhile, I sat there putting grease in my hair and, and, and eyelashes coming out of my nostrils and egg on my face to give myself a terrible complexion. And, and I'm sitting in my bedroom doing this over a period of like a month. That whole character was sitting in my bedroom and I couldn't get an audition. So I remember I called one of the producers and he answered the phone. You know, it's one of those moments that you just, you're lucky. And he said the same thing. We love your work, but we just don't think you're right for this. And I said, well, I created this whole character and this whole thing. And he said, oh, he said, well, all right. Why don't you come in on Thursday? So this is Monday. So Thursday, I get dressed up as Mrs. Dumars with the hair and the eyelashes and the skin and the, the brow and the voice and the dirty fingers, <laughs> I mean, the whole nine yards. And I drive to Santa Monica, which is where they were holding auditions. So I got there and when I got out of my car, the parking lot attendant <laughs> sort of flung himself against a wall. <laughs> you know, like, and I said, no, 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 I'm just in a, I'm in a costume. This is a costume. <laughs> so, I come in and I sit down. There's no chairs, I remember. And Rick Montgomery, so I, he kept walking by me. And finally, after about a half hour, I said, Rick. And he looked down. He said, Lynn? I said, yeah. He said, oh, my God. I, he said, we're going to call the police. We thought you were a homeless woman off the, off the street. Oh, my God. So anyway, I auditioned and I got the part. Pete said they were laughing so hard. Pete said we, we couldn't even see anybody for about 20 minutes after you had come in. The next day, I called Steve Stabler to thank him, and he said, I'm not supposed to tell you, but you got cast. That's my favorite role I've ever had. With uh, Mary, I saw again, you know, I mean, it's reading the trades. I mean, I saw they were doing this movie, and um, that Ben Stiller was cast. And so again, I start calling, and they brought me in for an audition, <laughs> which is after this is movie number three. And again, I didn't know... Uh, they said, thank you. I mean, it was all very, you know, very sort of cut and dried. I did my best. I had, I came in with a character. It wasn't what she ended up being because we didn't know. Once I got the job, um, they told me they were shooting in Miami and they wanted her to look like an old leather bag. You really have established yourself not only in, you know, just drama or horror, but also in comedy in those films that you mentioned before, and also in comedies like Detroit Rock City, where yeah. you played the kiss-hating mom, and Boat Trip, where you played Sonia the Tough Joe. I love like Boat Trip. People don't know about Boat Trip. Have you seen Boat Trip? Boat Trip is hilarious. <laughs> you, you guys got to find it. It's worth seeing. 
I mean, people don't, they sort of never had any buzz or anything with it. It's hilarious. Solid. It was great. <laughs> Check it out. And of course, with all those roles that you play, and then you switched over playing the alcoholic mom in the Hillside Strangler right after you did those. So. That's one of my, also my favorite things. Ooh. Here, it was here. I also just played Ted Bundy's mother, by the way, in another movie. So I think the trivia question is, what actress has played the mother of two serial killers? <laughs> I'm gonna win. <laughs> Do you find it refreshing getting to play so many versatile roles and getting to switch, you know, between the different genres? Oh, of course I do. I mean, I, I don't really ever think about genre. I just think about the character. I don't want to do th the same thing over and over ever. So for me, it's more about variety of story, you know, and character. Lynn, you have a huge cult following in the horror genre and starred in dozens of movies, including Critters. You mentioned earlier Wes Craven's uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. You did Snakes on the Plane. You did the indie film Midnight Man. And of course, you know, we, we can't mention horror films without mentioning a little something that you and I shared, the film Get Gone. Right. That we did, where I had the distinct honor of chewing up some really cool scenery with you. Yep, you were great in it too. Thank you. did a great job. Thank you so much. It really means a lot. Those people in town treat my boys. Make them feel like garbage, like monsters. We ain't leaving. Time to get your ass out of our damn woods, you freak. Leave us alone. I'm just trying to do my job. Get off my porch! And it was it was just an honor working alongside you. Well, vice versa. It was great to work with you too. No, really. No, you did. No, you were great on that. You really did. You did a great job. Thank you. It was great watching your process and just seeing, you know, just seeing the, some of the things that you came up with as we were playing with the scenes. And then there was the Insidious series, directed by James Wan, who called you the name of the franchise. Yeah. <laughs> That's what he said. That's what we picked up. Okay, I'll take it. Thank okay. you, James. Now, just like sci-fi franchises, the horror franchises are almost like a whole separate career and world all its own when you're dealing with fans, you're interacting with them um, online, at horror conventions, uh, things like that, and, and the overall experience as a whole. And how has that experience been for you? And did you ever think that this genre would turn you into basically the ultimate scream queen? No, I never, ever, really never, ever did. I, I don't, again, for me, labels are great because that's how people identify things about you often and give you a place in our business. But I never really thought about anything turning into anything other than just hopefully the scene came out well. <laughs> I don't really jump past much of anything. And I'm very detail oriented, actually. So that's always where what I go to in any situation, whether it be comedy, horror or drama, I don't really think too much about its place in the film world or part of a genre particularly. I hope I keep working. I hope I keep doing new stuff. There have been some things I had to turn down. That's why I really wanted to do the Ted Bundy thing because it was a great scene, a really wonderful scene of the mother. And again, it was about telling her story. It was a well-written piece of material too for me. So I still don't really put any blinkers on anything. I love horror films. I mean, a good horror film is, is a good horror film. There's a little film on Netflix 
Netflix I just saw, which I didn't know too much about, called One Bedroom. It's a scary little movie. Now with Netflix and all this, these um, options for showing your material, you know, and having things seen by a large audience is a whole new deal, really, for all of us. So I don't really have a preference about any of it. I had no predisposition to hoping it would turn into something with Insidious. We had no idea there'd be four movies. I remember James saying to me, the first one, maybe we shouldn't kill you because what if there's another movie? And I said, ah, oh, whatever, don't worry about it. <laughs> you know, so lo and behold, you know, there we were having to do prequels because they loved the character. I think my appeal is about telling the truth and tapping into things that we all feel. It has no age, no look to it. It's why we're artists. It's why we want to express something, whether you're an actor, a dancer, a painter. There's this drive to share our internal world with other people. And that's the easiest and safest way to do it. And you have seriously taken this horror franchise by storm in a way that you just never know with these uh, franchises. No, you don't. So, yeah, they're just so odd. You just never know where it's going to take you and how it's going to propel you. And you really don't see it coming. Do you think James Wan knew that? You know, I remember when he asked me to do the movie, it was not even a, that big of a role, the first Insidious. And suddenly, I remember even Jason Blum was talking to my manager and he said, people really love Lynn in that movie. And I'm going, wait a minute, Rose Byrne is in that movie. <laughs> Uh, maybe, uh, you, know, <laughs> you know, if Patrick Wilson is in that movie, I not necessarily think they would gravitate to Lynn Shea, but somehow they did. The one thing I thought about at least, because people have asked why I think people are attracted to her, and I think it's because she's not about her, she's about you, that her whole life is about taking care of other people. <laughs> You don't, especially because in the beginning, you don't even know anything about Elise. I mean, we found out later on, but that we're such an I society, you know, iPhone. It's all about me, 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 me. And Elise is all about you, 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 you. Hmm. She's about, she's a caregiver in the, in the, in the most wonderful sense. Yeah. And, and that without talking about that in the storyline, that's what she is. And people, I think, are longing for that on some level longing for that kind of feeling like she's gonna you know it's a real savior role it's a role of being a savior on some level without her being the savior you know without her her still right. with her still being sort of just this humble woman who you know it's funny they keep calling me dr elise rainier and i kept calling them out i said she's no doctor this woman doesn't hasn't been to college and has not you know i don't and they can and that was pinned on because of something people felt about the character but it's never, and I, I get, I actually get angry because I go, you're missing the point. She has no education. This woman never even went to college. You know, she lives by, and in my book, it was, this was something Lee Winnell and I had sort of, um, when I built the character from the very beginning, I saw her as an only child. I saw her as myself, that she played in her bedroom basically and, and was so open these entities were came to her because she was had a purity about her that there was no other static she had no static as a child that she kind of lived in her own world we all know that after watching a horror film it is sometimes impossible to turn off the lights and peacefully fall asleep uh, you are an actor who works so much in the horror genre so you have to spend weeks literally immersed in those blood chilling stories has it ever affected your ability to sleep at night? And do you remember any moment when you got really scared from the material you worked on? No. <laughs> that was a long time. No. is a tough cookie. <laughs> no, I, I just haven't. There's things I see on television, you know, like this movie I was telling you about that are really upsetting imagery. And I mean, you guys know too, when you do it, it's very nuts and bolts, first of all. And I've been in scenes in the grudge, actually, there was um, a scene which is not even in the final film. I think it's in the director's cut, which I've never seen. I actually would like to see it where it was a, a seizure that basically I'm having a woman who's trying to kill herself and can't do it. She keeps taking stuff to try to kill herself and it's not happening. And so she has a seizure. After we shot it, I was really upset. I always say your body doesn't know you're pretending. You know, that's the other thing. So you can put yourself into a, a state, which is kind of what I did for this. I had to sit down and be quiet for about 10, 15 minutes before I could really sort of regain my, I couldn't stop crying. I mean, I was really hysterical. 
I got really hysterical. And it was not, not to a scary point, but it was to the point I had to let it run its course. Just shut myself off. I couldn't do it. So that kind of thing. I'm not scared of scary things. I'm scared of real things. A little bit ago, you mentioned producing and also you just now mentioned the grudge. You've started wearing this different hat of producing and executive producing for films, The Call, Room for Rent, The Grudge, Dreamcatcher. I myself am also a producer along with being um, an actor. So I understand that side of it as well. So with that new responsibility with that other title you now have, what are some things that you've learned as a producer that you didn't know before diving into that side? The kind of producer I am really is usually a, a taste maker in a way. I don't so much have original ideas about stuff as much as being able to censor somebody else's. You know, it's like I can look at a, a piece of dialogue and say what I think is missing or, or how, it, how well it's written or if it expresses what the idea is, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I think it's sort of, I, I haven't really, like The Call, which is going to be released, I think, at the end of October. It's me and Tobin Bell, so it's going to be a very, it's a great sales tool. <laughs> That's which is the first thing I said to them. I'm also a sales person. I come from a business, and my family also were business people. I understand some parts of business and ad, like how to advertise something. There's a logo that I like or don't like. I'm usually pretty good with that kind of thing. But with the call, we did a lot of rewriting on the, on the script, which just made it, again, clarification. If you're setting up a world and a universe, you better say what your universe is, which is what Lee Winnell was so good at in Insidious. I mean, that whole first Insidious is describing the further. So you know where your fear is. You know where you're going. It's very important. If you're not letting your audience in, then they're not going to come in. They aren't going to get what you're talking about. And there was some stuff in the call that we changed quite a bit in terms of my character. And when I saw the final, the edit that I just saw, I wasn't so sure about it. I, there was a sequence. I, I guess I saw the story as being more about me and my character than it ends up being because it's really about these kids. So my story's initiated in a different way and in a different um, sequence than I imagined. And it took me some time to sort of accept that, but I'm not the final answer. I mean, you know, this is up to the director and the editor, certainly. And it was explained to me why they chose to do it that way. You're watching The Lightning Hour with Rico, Rochelle, and Sasha. We're chilling with Emmy Award winner Lynn Shea. Let's take a look at another video of Lynn's work. You're looking for a room? Yeah, just got to town. Looking for a place to stay for a while. Oh. I know that place. It's already been rented. They probably just... just forgot to take this back. But guess what? What? Today's your lucky day. Because I have a room that has just become available. Do you? Mm-hmm. Would you like to see it? Sure, why not? Oh, um, I'm Joyce. Bob. That is a very nice name. You are a uh, porter of the Sheldrick Wildlife Trust. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you adopted a little bitty baby elephant named I adopted an elephant. This is a great work. It's a great, you really did your work. <laughs> is, is that how you pronounce the name? Here it is. Wait a minute. Look at those ears! <laughs> Mako is a troublemaker too, apparently. Um, they send you, it's the best, it's the best organization, you guys, because first of all, also for gifts, you can adopt, a, you know, you're not the only person who adopts it. They, it it's a way of them keeping their funds because it's all donations. It's, I visited there, we were there a year ago, January, um, and I actually met my elephant my baby, oh my God. And they're like, they are the, you just can't believe how incredible they are. And this, this place is so beautiful. Um, it's in, uh, in Nairobi. And I went with this group, um, Brighton Jones is the name of the group. It's a financial organization out of Seattle. Okay. And they support um, a, a whole community there of almost 2 million people. Um, this is it's a really one. Th this organization is really wonderful. They are not just about making money. They're you know they're hugely philanthropic, 
and um, it's the Makuru slums, it's called, which is one of the biggest slums in the world. It's like India, you know, they, two million people and something like two, no, it's a million people in 2.2 square miles. And they live in little tin, literally boxes, five by five, five feet by five feet, little tin boxes. And it was the most upsetting experience I ever had. And I had no idea. I thought we were just going on a safari and to see the elephants. But we did community work there for almost um, seven days before we even did the safari. And it was really eye-opening. I mean, you talk about how lucky we are. Oh, my God, you have no idea. We have, I had no idea. So, um, so, so Makoa is, um, I had another little guy who died. He, he, they rescue these animals whose mothers have been killed by poachers and, um, and they rescue them because the, they get, the one little guy that I got, this little guy Makoa was rescued from a mud pit mm-hmm. and these bush people were gonna eat him. They were gonna kill him and eat him. And the rangers, these rangers patrol the areas and they, they try and find these animals that are left alone. And they came down and they got him and they rehabilitated him. And he's now a little wise guy. He's now going on almost two years old. I mean, he was a baby when they got him. So the, what I was going to say is the way I found them is they, they asked me if I wanted, what was any, if I could have anything I wanted, what would I want? And I said, an elephant. <laughs> And I've always, I have always had a thing for elephants. So they called me and said, it was around my birthday. And they said, we want, need to talk to you about something. And I thought they were going to tell me all my money was gone or something, something really, you know, terrible. And then they said, we hear you like elephants. And they told me they adopted me, this little guy from, and what you do is you get a certificate. It's $50 for a full year. Mm. So it's a great present to give to people who you don't, they have little hippos, they have baby, they, they had three baby hippos. I don't know how many elephants they have now, but there's a whole website. Look at their website. It's called the, um, what did we say? The David Sherrick, wait a minute, let me see if I can, uh, it's the David Sheldrick Wildlife, um, uh, S-H-E-L, I mean, where's my thing? Where's my little thing? I hate it. Here it is. Um, yeah, the Sheldrick Wildlife Trust.org. S H E L D R I C K Wildlife, W I L D L I F E T R U S T. Sheldrick Wildlife Trust.org. And you'll see all these great little guys. Here's a little guy named Naboshu. And then they give you his update. They tell you on the 27th, um, veterinary unit was called to perform a post mortem on an elephant female who was found dead. Uh, in the Mara. She was a well-known female to many who had been fitted with a radio collar. Um, and, and they found, and she was found lifeless and her young calf was now in the company of the herd who had moved to a short distance away. And they rescue them and, and, um, and rehabilitate them. They have elephants there who've been there 10 years who then they release back into the wild once they've been re, you know, they, they go really slow and they bond to their their um, keeper like a parent. So the keepers, um, it's incredible. These keepers are these angels, these beautiful young men who devote their lives to these animals and literally sleep in their stalls. They're with them 24 hours a day, except for the eight hours they're out on the Mara where they're out with their with the herd. And then they bring them back and they feed them and they give them bottles of milk, these giant bottles of milk. These little babies are, they, you know, they get their, their, their nose up and they down them, down them, down them. And Makoa apparently is, is real, real pushy, like wants his milk as soon as he gets back and starts pushing at you. And they're so funny. They, and they totally related to us. And my little guy was, he was watching me from, and he was eating his, 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 bir- his little birch branches. They give him all these branches. It was a miraculous trip and um, and well worth if again if you if you can't think of a good gift to give somebody it's just they send a whole little certificate and then they give you updates every month about how your animal's doing and they there's these long beautiful descriptions of their lives that are just exquisite so yeah it's a good one that's a great yeah that's a great idea and it's so doable so it's totally doable and and they need us i mean they really they have you know we support them 100 percent. so yeah worth it all right lynn shay how can people find you on social media 
Um, I have a, I do have a Facebook page. Um, it's usually got a lot of people on it, but they drop off too. They get bored of all the, bo um, yeah, I have a, I have a, tw I have a Twitter account. I have accounts, all those accounts. I have Twitter, I have um, Instagram and I have Facebook. So I'm on all of them. Yay. Yes, you can can. Some of them, are, Ms., um, for, for Instagram is Ms. Lynn Shea, M-S-L-I-N-S-H-A-Y-E, Ms. Lynn Shea. And um, for Twitter, I think it's just Lynn Shea, and for Facebook, it's Lynn Shea. So, that's awesome. All. I'm there. Woo! Yeah. Lynn Shea, <laughs> the godmother of horror and the award winning actress. Woo! 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 Dozens of films and TV shows, including the Insidious franchise, Penny Dreadful, A Nightmare on Elm Street, There's Something About Mary, Dumb and Dumber, Get Gone, and many, many more. Who's with us today? Lynn, thank you so much for being on the show. We oh have a big time. You know more about me now than my mother. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> that was a long interview, you guys, but it was really fun, and thank you. I, it was very, uh, very cathartic for me. I, um, Seriously, I mean, I really appreciate um, remembering kind of who I am on some level. You know, this has been a very isolation, very isolated experience for me with um, without the community that I'm used to being with and enjoying. So um, thank you so much. I really had a wonderful, a wonderful afternoon with you. I just all I miss is a glass of wine now and going swimming. <laughs> Go have it and go swim and, and have a great time. Lynn, it was it was great talking with you. Thank you so much. Oh, you're much. a doll, Rico. You're yeah. also really, t I mean, I don't know the two women, although I know R Rochelle and I know Sasha is probably are both fantastic actors. They are. They really are very, very gifted. You're a fantastic talent. And I wish you great success also in everything you're doing. So thank, thank you so much. Man. Well, I look forward to working with you again in some Yeah, time. let's do it, guys. Yes. We will. Yeah. Really quick. This was the Lightning Hour Halloween Season Edition. I am your host, Rico E. Anderson. I'm your host, Sasha Kerbo. And I'm your host, Rochelle Henry. Please support us by giving this video a like, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and click that little bell sign below so you'll get notifications when we post new shows. Follow us on social media to learn more about the Lightning Hour and the three of us, its hosts. You'll find the links as well as more info about our guests in the description below. We encourage you to post your questions for us in the comment section, as well as on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll be answering them in future episodes. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next Friday, same time, same place. Have a great week, everyone. Bye. Bye.